Hello, my name is Greta wilson Hengen, and I will be talking about environmental changes in desert bighorn movement patterns today. To give you all some background, we define pathogen spillover as transmission of disease from an infected population to a naive population. And this process depends on host contact networks and space use, which space use in wildlife is influenced by resource availability. So the intent of this project is to tie annual resource variability to movements in space use that shape endemic disease transmission and disease burden in desert bighorn. As you all know, desert bighorn have been infected with mycoplasma of pneumoniae, some respiratory bacterial pathogen that's been introduced by domestic goats and sheep. And when introduced to a desert bighorn population can lead to significant declines. Uh, managers try to mitigate MOV transmission by modeling space use and movement. However, the models for um, disease transmission risk have all been derived from uh, Rocky Mountain bighorn sheep populations and music riverine parts of Idaho, Washington, and Oregon. These areas are characterized by a low annual coefficient of variation compared to the Mojave Desert. Um, and as a result, they have very consistent year-to-year -year vegetation emergent patterns, as opposed to the Mojave Desert, there's a really high coefficient of variation for vegetation emergent from year to year. And as a result of a consistent year-to-year -year vegetation emergent, you have more predictable movement patterns. Um, so typically with Rocky Mountain bighorn sheep, you expect to see them come up to the high elevation in the summer range following green up and then move back down to lower elevations in the winter time. And across a lot of different species, um, this is a common pattern where when you have lower variability from year to year, you tend to see more range residency or consistent migratory patterns. But then as the environmental variability increases from year to year, you have more sporadic movement or nomadic movement patterns. And so we are examining the movement patterns of desert bighorn sheep in the Mojave Desert. And the way we've thought about their movement is we've broken it up into three categories. Localized behaviors when relocations have a short step in between them and a really high turn angle. Intermediate localization where there's a longer step length um, and a narrower turn angle, but they're not quite making a long distance movement. And then transient behaviors where there's long directed movements with low turn angles, they're essentially going straight and going for a long time. And we want to tie localized space use patterns to changes in home range size. Um, and through that tied uh, how environmental variables affect movement to how they might thereafter affect home range from year to year. So we are studying desert bighorn sheep in the muddy mountains of Southern Nevada. Uh, we had 12 collared ewes during a 12 month collaring period and we focused on a 24 hour fix rate. And to give you a sense of what we did, we examined movement using a three state hidden Markov model. And then we examined these movements as a function of time of year and plant biomass. We measured plant biomass using a normalized difference vegetation index or NDVI. And then in the Mojave Desert, since it does get so hot and dry during the summer, uh, bighorn sheep in this area have a unique ecology that they um, are dependent on point source water guzzlers that the state of Nevada has set up around Southern Nevada. And I know some other states do this as well. So we've broken up um, the biological year for sheep into two different phases. The summer, quote unquote, when they're dependent on water guzzlers and we've defined this from May to end of October and then uh, winter season when they're independent of the water guzzlers from November through the end of April. And this varies from year to year depending on conditions, but this is kind of the typical pattern. And so we've broken up our hypotheses based on these two biological seasons. Um, so during the summer, we expect that animals will have to localize near water and therefore as plant biomass decreases, duration and frequency of localized movements will increase. In the winter, we expect that animals will want to localize at good forage areas 
And so therefore we expect as plant biomass increases, duration and frequency of localized movements will also increase. And so to do this, we had to delineate areas across the landscape where sheep um, might find forage. So we took a resource selection uh, function product made um, by Kathy Longshore and Chris Lowry at the USGS um, for the Muddy Mountains, uh, overlaid this with a land cover raster from Southwest Regap um, that defines the landscape you know, by different vegetation types, rock outcroppings, et cetera. And then overlaid this with our GPS relocations from the Muddy Mountains so that we um, were sure we're using forage areas that the sheep were actually able to access and perceive. And so what we got out of this was seven different forage unit areas um, that ranged in size from about a half a kilometer to 50 or so kilometer, square kilometers. And then we masked these polygons over top of um, an NDVI raster in order to measure plant biomass within these polygons. And so NDVI is a satellite derived measure of plant biomass. Uh, our data is a daily 500 meter resolution. Um, and so with the polygons we overlaid on this raster, we would take the daily median value from all the pixels inside that polygon. And then since vegetation is so sparse in the Mojave Desert and so intermixed with just barren ground, we, instead of using raw and DVI measurements within a patch, measured the uh, coefficient of variation within a unit. And so CV is a relative measurement um, of the landscape. So it'll tell you how variable the landscape is um, relative to itself. And so it's defined as the standard deviation over the median NDVI in this case. And so with our GPS data, we ran a hidden Markov model, um, which the way a hidden Markov model works is that it relies on step length and turning angles between GPS re relocations to define different movement behavior states. And then it groups these trajectories into different behavior states. So in this cartoon example, um, these relocations with short steps and high turn angles would be categorized as localized short distance. These intermediate step lengths with slightly lower turn angles would be defined as intermediately localized. And then these long step lengths with low turn angles would be uh, defined as long distance movements. Uh, and so then this is a breakdown of um, our different behavioral states output by the model. So our long distance movements um, are up here in black. And so they had a high average step length and a very low average turning angle. Our intermediate step here in red has um, moderate step length and then still relatively high turning angle. But then our shortest localized state has the lowest average step length and the highest average turn angle. So we examined the probability of localization. Um, to do this, we combined the first two states and just looked at both of our local, localized states together and left out our long distance movements. And we found that the probability of being in either of those uh, localization, localized states actually decreased during the summer months. And we were expecting them to increase during the summer months when we thought they would have to be localized near water, but we actually found that they slightly decreased during the summer, except for the month of June, which is sort of an outlier for the whole data set. Um, and we think that this actually does make sense because um, they do have to kind of go back and forth um, from water to other areas across the landscape. They don't typically camp out at water overnight or anything. Um, so we do see a biologically relevant reason why this might happen um, as opposed to our prediction. Um, so then we examined the average proportion of time spent in each state across individuals. And we found that during the summer, again, there is this higher portion of time um, averaged across individuals that are spent in long distance movements. Um, 
and then a very short amount of time spent in localized movements during the summer. Whereas in the winter, localized movement, their proportion of time spent in localized movements increases and their proportion of time spent in long distance movement decreases from the summer. And then their intermediate movements are pretty similar between summer and winter. So next we looked at the effect of um, plant biomass variants on uh, the probability of transitioning among these different states. So we looked at um, how the probability of going from localized to intermediate or intermediate to long distance changed as a function of plant biomass variants across uh, the different forage units. So on the y-axis here, we have all the different transitions starting from localized to intermediate, localized to long distance, intermediate to localized, intermediate to long distance, long distance to localized or long distance to intermediate. And in this left panel here, we have the summertime and the right, we have the winter time. Um, and so for the first two transition state, either going from localized to intermediate or localized to long distance, we actually found that that transition happened so infrequently that there wasn't enough data to generate um, an effect size. The next transition is going from intermediate to localized. Um, and so we found in the summertime as plant biomass variance increases across the landscape, the probability of transitioning from intermediate to a localized state decreases. So they're more likely to stay in their intermediate than they are to localize, which is consistent with what we found in terms of the um, probability of localizing during the summer. So for our next transition, we looked at intermediate to long distance movements, and we found a weekly positive effect so that as um, plant biomass variance increases across the landscape, they uh, are insignificantly more likely to go from intermediate to long distance. But given that this crosses our zero line here, it's not a significant result statistically. And so next we looked at long distance to localized movements. And we again found that uh, that transition happened infrequently enough that we didn't have um, sufficient sample size to get an effect size. And finally, we have long distance to intermediate movements, which we again found um, a weekly positive effect. So as plant biomass variance increases across the landscape, they're slightly insignificantly more likely to go from long distance to intermediate. And so, um, and that's the same from intermediate to long distance. So they're weakly moving between those two states at the same, um, uh, same effect from plant biomass. And so here on the right, we have um, the effect during the winter time. And so they're, in, during the winter time, their probability of going from a localized state to an intermediate state is weakly uh, increased. <clears throat> but again, it crosses that zero line, so it's not a significant uh, transition. Um, going from localized to long distance, we again have an insufficient uh, sample size to measure and effect. And going from intermediate to localized, um, we did not find that there was any um, significant effect of plant biomass pretty evenly spread. We did find that going from an intermediate to a long distance movement, uh, the probability of that decreases as plant biomass increases. So, or as plant biomass variance increases. So as plant biomass variance increases along across the landscape, um, they are less likely to go from an intermediate movement to a long distance movement. And then for the last two transitions, we didn't find any significant effect. Then last, we looked at the duration of localized and uh, transient movements as a function of plant biomass variants. And we again combined the two different localized behaviors into just one. Um, so we made a converted those into a binary, either localized or transient, and combined those two states. Um, and we found that during the summer, uh, both localized and long distance movement durations increased as a function of plant biomass variants. Um, so 
the way we've interpreted that is you're more likely to stay in the state you're in as plant biomass increases. And then we didn't find any significant effect during the winter months. Um, it was just during the summer that this effect occurred. So in summary, we found that ewes have a lower probability of localized movements in the summer months than in the winter months, which was the opposite of what we predicted. And in the summer, we found that increased plant biomass variance is associated with decreased probability of transitioning from intermediate to localized movements, which again is the opposite of what we predicted. We thought they'd be more likely to um, transition into localized movements, but instead they're more likely or they're less likely to transition into localized movements. We found a weak increased probability of moving back and forth between intermediate and long distance movements, but not a significant trend. In the winter, we found in, with increased plant biomass variants, uh, there is a decreased probability of transitioning from an intermediate to a long distance movement. So this was consistent with our hypotheses um, as we predicted that they'd be more likely to localize as plant biomass increased during the winter, as they would want to stay on a good forage patch. Uh, we didn't find a significant trend with them um, switching to a um, localized short distance state. We only found that they were less likely to transition into foray as plant, uh, plant biomass variants increased. And we also found a weak increase in probability of moving from local to intermediate movements. But again, this wasn't significant. And then finally, we found that in the summer, increased plant biomass variance increases with the duration of both localized and long distance movements. And this trend was only in the summer. We didn't find anything significant during the winter months. So to follow up this study, we want to relate movements to home range and variation in home range size from year to year. So uh, following this, we want to examine when and where localization movements occur, as well as how localization timing relates to home range size. Um, so if there, we predict that as increases in localizations occur, this will be associated with a decrease in home range size. Um, and then we want to tie the environmental covariates that are driving movements to home range size. So the covariates that are driving uh, increased localization duration and frequency, we want to know if those are thereafter tied to changes or decreases in home range size. And so the broader impact of this research is that it'll augment disease transmission risk models for desert bighorn sheep. Um, we currently don't have any movement models that tie movement to disease transmission risk, as well as it'll set up an epidemiological forecasting framework that relates environmental variability to pathogen uh, transmission risk. And with that, I would like to thank Kathy Longshore of the USGS uh, Western Ecological Research Center. Um, the GPS data um, is her data. Um, I'd like to thank Pat Cummins of the Nevada Department of Wildlife um, and the Wild Sheep Foundation and Bureau of Land Management for um, funding for this project. And with that, I will take any questions. Thank you.